I'm really excited to have a really full room and, and what I know will be a very interesting conversation on, on privacy and civil society issues that will really challenge the office to do some thinking about how it approaches its job and hopefully inspire you uh, to think in a little more detail about uh, how privacy and data protection affects you and how you can contribute to this discussion. And with those comments, I'll extend my talking a little longer while the commissioner checks it. Blackberry? <laughs> 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 and welcome, uh, Commissioner Jennifer Stoddard. Thank you very much, Colin. Welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome to all our guests from Ottawa and um, this uh, region. Some of those. No. Okay. Uh, bravo. How about our visitor here? Would you like some? Uh, I can get by. It's fine. Okay. My mom's actually French. So I think I can get oh, really? By. Hey, wow. Okay. Thus, we are quite pleased to um, greet you here from the Commissioner of uh, the Privacy Commissioner, and we are proud to um, uh, of the research directorate which uh, Colin heads. Uh, they are the artists of our office. They are the ones who uh, show creativity and uh, who lead us into the future. So over the next year, following in Rio's footsteps then, we're planning at our office to use these discussions to explore a range of different perspectives on privacy. We're interested in broadening our understanding of privacy in various disciplines, such as psychology, criminology, sociology, and design. You could go on from there. Health, for example, if you think of genetic privacy, and there's no end. We hope that this will help provide our office with a greater understanding of new and sometimes provocative approaches to privacy, but we also hope that these talks will inspire people to become more privacy conscious. This spring, we held a series of public consultations. Jesse Hurst uh, fortunately participated in them in the first one in Toronto, in which we heard many experts stress the importance of education, educating people about the risks to their privacy online. It's a statement that has been echoed elsewhere from international data protection conferences to the elementary school where my staff are frequently called to speak. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada is mandated with the role of educating the public about privacy issues, among other things. So our challenge is always to find fresh, innovative ways of nudging people to think more about how they can protect their privacy in a fun way. So on that note, I'm very pleased to turn uh, the podium over to Colin McKay, our Director of Public Education and Outreach, um, our moderator for the day. So he can formally introduce Jesse Hirsch and Christopher Segoyan, two gentlemen known for their strong views on privacy issues. I'd like to thank you both Jesse and Christopher for agreeing to join us, join us for this first Insight on Privacy event. Il y en a d'autres sessions à suivre. Colin. As the Commissioner mentioned, uh, Jesse Hirsch uh, is, a, is a commentator and a, a CBC radio columnist and there are many other descriptions I, we could give to you. Extremely interested in privacy issues and the uh, integration of technology into society. Um, here in Ottawa we can hear him on Monday mornings at 6.40 on CBC Radio 1 um, and he's also available on many other outlets throughout the week as demand comes and as we see privacy crises develop. And Chris Segoyan um, is a PhD candidate at uh, Indiana University in the School of Computer Science. And uh, most recently, he was uh, a contract consultant with the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, providing technical support for their investigations. Um, but one of the reasons he got that job was because for many, many years, um, he's made it his vocation to examine uh, privacy and security threats, particularly in the online environment and identify not only the weaknesses, but the sort of tools that can be applied to solve those weaknesses, at least as we wait for regulatory or technical, uh, technical solutions. Um, what I'd like to do is turn, uh, turn the conversation over to Chris for a few minutes, simply to provide an introduction and an overview of the discussion we've had as an office and of the, uh, the paper he's prepared for the office. And then I'll turn to Jesse for, for a similar short discussion. And then we'll start having a, a panel discussion among the three of us. 
and we'll also, as I mentioned, be open to Q's and A's from the audience as that evolves. It'll be, uh, it'll be a, a, a reflective process among the three of us and hopefully iterative among, among all of us in the room. So, uh, Chris, with that? So it's about half an hour, I get, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you just want to drone on in a constant voice. T tell, then... tell, me, tell me when to stop, okay? Okay. <laughs> all right. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, so, as a, again, as a little bit of background, so I'm a, a student, I'm a privacy activist. Uh, I've worked on, on every side of, of this issue now, I think. So I've been an, uh, an activist. I've worked for public interest civil liberties organizations like the ACLU. Uh, I've uh, been uh, an academic. I've worked for companies like Google and Apple and IBM. Uh, I've, been, I've worked for the feds, uh, and I've also been investigated multiple times by the feds. Um, uh, so I, th I think I have a, a somewhat interesting perspective. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not a lawyer by training, uh, but I've, I've worked with enough and been investigated by enough that I do know their language and, and can generally uh, frame issues in, in, in a way that both the technologists, lawyers, and laypeople can understand. Um, so I, I want to talk today a little bit about privacy by design and, and sort of the, the privacy landscape today and why we really don't have tools that are safe and why industry hasn't given it to us and maybe a, a way forward. Um, for regulators and technology companies and, and, and users. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of things said about privacy by design in, in regulatory circles. It's a really hot topic, um, but companies really aren't delivering it. And, and so first, let's talk about what we have today, right? So we're all using software to, to, to navigate the internet. We have cell phones and laptops and web browsing software that, that we're using. And this software, by and large, is made by advertising companies, right? So we are using, Internet Explorer, which is made by Microsoft, which is a large advertising company. We're using Google Chrome, which is made by Google, an advertising company. Um, we're using Firefox, which, is, which gets 90% of their revenue from Google for the search deal. They get, I think, 90 or $100 million a year from Google. Um, uh, even Apple gets money from Google for making uh, Apple, uh, the, uh, the, search engine, uh, the Google search engine the default. So the web browsers are all controlled by advertising companies. And even the platforms that we're using, the entire Android platform, which is provided to cell phone companies for free, is made by Google, and the, the, you know, they, are, they get their money because you're using their, their platform and searching and seeing ads. And I don't think consumers really understand this. I don't think that consumers understand that the software that they're using is made by these companies, and, and that the, the, the companies that are providing the software have an incentive to make it easy to track them. Right? In, in years past, before Microsoft had become an advertising company, you gave them money for software. They got you know, money for Word or for Office or for Microsoft Windows, and they, they still get money that way too. Uh, but in those old days, they didn't have an incentive to, to, to let you be tracked. They just had an incentive to keep you upgrading to, to Office every three years. Um, now they have an incentive to make it easy to track you. And so what we have is software that does not protect our privacy, that have awful defaults. Right? So you're tracked everywhere you go around the web. The advertisements you see today are based on websites that you, went, that you, did, that you visited a month ago, on searches that you did two weeks before. Um, you uh, collect cookies, which are small text files from, given to you by websites everywhere you go. The, the web browsers that you're using do not make it easy to either delete the cookies, to view the cookies, to differentiate the good cookies, the shopping cart, uh, the way that Amazon can recognize you, the volume control on YouTube, from the bad cookies, right? So the advertising networks that are tracking you. If you look in the cookie interface in your browser, which most consumers have never tried to use, uh, it, it's impossible to, to, to differentiate the good from the bad. They all look the same. They're all ones and zeros, A, B, C, one, two, three. Um, and, and so what it means is that you, the only real option you have is to delete them all. And of course, once you delete them all, and then you have to sign back into your email account, and you have to sign back into your YouTube account, you have to sign back into Twitter, that gives you a, a strong disincentive to do this again and again and again. Maybe you'll do this when you're in private browsing mode, but you won't navigate the web in private browsing mode. You know, the industry got worried that consumers were deleting cookies, even though most are not. Uh, and so we've seen the industry moving to flash cookies, which are equally difficult to delete. Uh, I would venture that most people in this room probably have never deleted their cookies, but I would be surprised if more than five people in this room have ever deleted a flash cookie or even know how to delete a flash cookie. 
Uh, another big problem that we see is that the websites that consumers are interacting with, particularly as we move from uh, a website that isn't very interactive to a web application like Gmail and Facebook and Twitter, where you're, you're really running an app in the, uh, in the web browser, these are not secure. And so there, there was a lot of, of controversy and publicity about this Firesheep application that, that came out a month or two ago that makes it trivial for someone sitting next to you in Starbucks or Tim Hortons um, to, uh, to, does Tim Hortons have free Wi-Fi? No. no. Okay, so not Tim Hortons then. Um, okay, so it makes it trivial for that person sitting next to you at the coffee shop or the library or the school or the hospital to easily hijack your Facebook account your Yahoo Mail account, uh, your Hotmail account. So in January of this year, Google started defaulting to using encryption by default for Gmail. This is a great thing. Um, but for years before, they had said that, you know, while they offered encryption, they said that they wanted to leave this to user choice. If consumers want encryption and safety from hackers, they will choose to use this option. But of course, the company wasn't advertising the availability of this option. If you went into the configuration for Gmail, it was the last of 13 options. After the, vac the vacation uh, away message, the changing your keyboard language type, you know, every possible option that you really wouldn't ever tweak was in front of the one that would protect you the most when you're using your, your email in public. Today, Hotmail, uh, as of a month ago, Hotmail now offers uh, encryption, but again, there's no message on, on the front page that you can turn this on, and Microsoft hasn't done the right thing and turned it on by default, or even told people that this option exists. Uh, of course, users of Yahoo and Facebook and Twitter are screwed because those companies don't even offer. Oh, so tw Twitter does, but they don't advertise it. But Yahoo and Facebook users have, have no option to protect themselves. Uh, and, and so, you know, I guess you could have two options here. One, the companies could protect their users, but two, they could at least let them know that their products are not safe when, using, uh, uh, when being connected to in a, in a public environment. And so what we really have here is, is a, a, an internet uh, and an experience online that is not safe by default, uh, in which the companies are, are in many ways benefiting. In, some in, in, one, in one case, they're benefiting because we're giving them our data. And in other cases, they are not benefiting by making us exposed to hackers, but it costs them money to protect us, and they don't really uh, want, to, want to do that. Uh, but, but we definitely have a situation where the, the software that we're using is not safe by default, and the companies are not embracing privacy by design. Um, we also have an arms race. So we have the companies that are providing us the technology, and then we have this entire industry of companies who are there to follow us and track us. And you know, the advertising, the, 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 the tracking companies, they're not providing us a service. They're not providing us free software or, or news articles or, or applications. They are just tracking us and making money off, off of us. And they are truly engaged in an arms race. Right? So it used to be that uh, four or five years ago, you navigated the web and you would see pop-up ads everywhere. And you would try to close them and then another one would pop up and you would try to close that. And usually the ads would get more and more obscene each time you pop them up um, and, until finally you know, it, would, it would blind your, your eyes. Um, and, and what we saw was that there was a little bit of innovation in this space. Right? So first the Opera browser included a pop-up blocker and then I think Firefox did one uh, and then Microsoft did one and then all the search engines included toolbars that blocked pop-ups. Um, and, and what we had over the course of a year or two is suddenly all of the web browsers started blocking pop-ups by default. Great. But then all the ad companies innovated around this and started doing pop-unders and then HTML5-based pop-ups, right, where you still see a big ad that takes over your screen, but the technology that you've been given to stop that doesn't work anymore. Right? And if you ask the companies w w why they did this, well, they say, oh, we didn't realize that consumers didn't want pop-ups. We just thought they didn't want those kind of pop-ups. Right? They're innovating around our technology. Now, in this case, this isn't a privacy issue. This is an annoyance one. Um, but if you look at the tracking technologies, we see the same thing. So for, for many years, cookies have been the primary vehicle by which consumers are tracked. The ad companies get worried that consumers are deleting cookies, so they shift to flash cookies. Uh, then the, the companies are complaining that flash rookies are being deleted or that the government may regulate flash rookies out of existence. So they move to exploiting browser cache or they uh, move to super cookies. Uh, there's a, a, a program released a few weeks ago or a few months ago called Evercookie that uses like five different technologies to persistently track you. Um, again, because the previous cookie technologies were deemed to be uh, in insufficient. 
then uh, the EverCookie mechanisms are, are being dealt with. So now we have companies fingerprinting devices where, you, where there's nothing you can clear to ever get rid of your fingerprint. As in, the fingerprint of your phone today is going to be the same fingerprint next week and next month and, and a year from now. And there's nothing you can do to opt out or clear uh, or, or to sever this, this, this connection between you and their database. So we also have companies exploiting browser flaws. There was a, a fantastic uh, article uh, that came out a week or two ago in Forbes talking about how YouPorn, the 61st most popular website on the internet, is reaching into your browser and finding which of their competitors you've been to in the past. This is a result of an academic uh, study by universities at the University of uh, uh, San Diego, I think. Um, and they, they crawled the web and they found probably 30 or 40 different companies that were exploiting a flaw. And, and browsers. They weren't finding out where else you were going right now. They were finding out where you'd been three or four weeks ago. Uh, and the, the browser vendors have just recently uh, fixed this. And uh, I think Chrome and Safari users are fixed today. Firefox users will be, will be fixed in the spring. And who knows when Microsoft users uh, will be fixed. Um, the company hasn't announced, at least publicly, any, any plans to fix this. But really, what we have is an arms race. And what companies are able to say is, oh, we thought consumers didn't want to be tracked with cookies. We didn't know they didn't want to be tracked with flash cookies. Or we thought that consumers didn't want to be tracked with those mechanisms. But we didn't, they didn't tell us they didn't want us to reach into their browser and see where they'd been last week. Um, and the reason for this is that all of the technologies that we have, all of these privacy enhancing technologies, they stop one specific thing. But there's no way for a consumer to tell the, the internet at large, leave me alone. Right? There's no way for you to express your desire to be left alone. And so there's some discussion in Washington right now about this idea of a do not track mechanism. And one of the really compelling things for me, and I'm not really going to go into, into the details of do not track, but the compelling thing for me is that it's the one opportunity for you to tell someone, leave me alone. Right? They are not going to be able to ignore that and say, oh, we only thought you didn't want to be tracked through this one specific mechanism. You're going to be telling them, overall, leave me alone. You know, I also want to talk about the approach that companies take. And, and because I don't work for the government in, anymore, and because you guys have already promised to pay me, uh, I can name names. And, 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 and you are going to pay me, right? Yeah, yeah OK. Um, what are the names? <laughs> so I think you know, there's, a, there's a, a specific style that Facebook has perfected, which is to totally violate the privacy of their customers. And then and on you know, the one or two occasions in which people complain, they say, whoops, sorry about that. We didn't really mean to do that. And then they inch things back just a few, a few bits. right? But in the meantime, the damage is done. Users' privacy has been violated. The defaults have been changed. Everyone's information is available on, on the web. Maybe they get you know, their, their knuckles wrapped by a privacy regulator. Maybe they get a class action lawsuit filed against them. Maybe they pay $10, $20 million. But who cares? They're worth $50 billion, and 500 million users have their information out there on the web. They have changed the very fabric of the web and the way that privacy is thought about by most users. Right? And, and you know, they have really perfected this art of do it first and ask forgiveness later. And I don't think that the, the current mechanism by which privacy is regulated uh, really is, is doing much for this, because these companies benefit so much by, by asking first and, and, and begging forgiveness later. Now, you know, the industry does respond to um, privacy regulators and lawsuits. But oftentimes, their, their responses are, are pretty insignificant. Um, and so you know, in the area of behavioral advertising, where you're tracked everywhere on the web and the ad you see relates to that search you did two weeks ago, um, we have self-regulatory um, uh, 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 system in place. Uh, all of the major good responsible players offer opt-outs. So uh, maybe some of you in this room have been to the Network Advertising Initiative website, or do, you guys don't have a Canadian equivalent of, of the NAI, do you? But the, all, all the NAI companies yeah. track, you, track you here anyway. Um, so you can go to this website and get these opt-out cookies that don't opt you out of the collection of data. They just opt you out of the use of your data. Um, if you get these cookies, they can expire. They can be deleted. We have the system where the way that you opt out, you get a cookie, is the very same vehicle by which they track you. And so if you try and stop being tracked, you delete all your cookies, you also delete the opt outs. So you, you l it's funny, but it's sad and true. Right? So you know, we in the technology community, we recommend that consumers delete their cookies. If you know what a cookie is, we recommend that you delete them. But the way that you opt out 
is also through a cookie. And, and you know, this is a very, very broken mechanism. Uh, and the industry likes the fact that it is a broken mechanism because they know that no one's going to use it, no one's going to discover it. And if they do discover it, it's probably not going to stick around for very long. And the purpose of this mechanism isn't to protect user privacy. The pur purpose of this mechanism is to let those companies go before Congress and say, we've done something. You, you know, Congress has called for industry to be responsible. We have delivered this mechanism. We have this little icon in the ads. You can click on it and learn how you've been targeted. And then you can click a button and you'll be opted out. And then, you know, then you've been, been able to express your choice. But the companies don't want to make it easy. And they don't want to make it persistent. What they want to be able to do is say they did something. So companies will always fight regulation. And so as, as this debate in Washington heats up right now over do not track and over comprehensive privacy reform, the companies are, are funneling millions of dollars into lobbying efforts. They have these fake grassroots groups that are talking about reasonable compromises. Um, and, and they are fighting things. And they say, you know, if consumers really care about this, they can download Adblock Plus. They can download you know, these browser tools uh, to, to take care of things. You know, consumers can take matters into their own hands. Well, you know, many industries fight regulation. And they all look stupid after the fact, once we actually have the protection in place. And I think the best example of this uh, is the, the auto industry. When they were fighting seatbelt laws, uh, you know, decades ago, there was a, a congressional hearing over, over, over seatbelt laws. And I think Ralph Nader uh, was on one side of, of, of the table. And on the other side, you had these auto executives. And you had this executive saying, you know, we don't need seatbelts because, you know, when I have my kid in the front seat and I stop at a stoplight, I quickly put my arm out. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's up to parents to do the right thing to, to, to protect their children. Why should the government be for forcing the auto companies to, to do that? And, uh, you know, we can look back and, and laugh at that. But there were members of Congress who said, oh, that's a totally appropriate, uh, you know, thing. Why should we, we be forcing companies to, to pay money uh, to, to, to protect people? Uh, and I think we have the same thing today, right? The tools that which, you're, which we're using are making it easy for us to be tracked. And I think that regulators should be taking an aggressive role uh, in, in making sure that the technologies we use are safe and are working for us, not against us. Now, you know, I understand that the authority of privacy regulators in many countries are limited, particularly in the US. Uh, the, the FTC's power really comes down to either deception or unfairness. And to, for, it, for something to be deceptive, the company has to lie. And as long as the company either doesn't disclose it or doesn't lie about it, it's not deceptive. And for there to be harm, you have to, actually, you have to show that people have really suffered. And currently, being tracked on the web is not considered harm. And so all of these tracking mechanisms are totally, totally fine as long as the companies are either upfront or just don't disclose it. The only time they get in trouble is if they say, we protect your privacy, we won't track you, and then they really do track you. And so what I want to, what I want to propose is a model of transparency. You know, there's, I think, a, there's a strong history of consumer regulators being able to force companies to tell consumers about the risks in products. Even if there's not the political will or the power to ban products outright. So, you know, in, in Canada, cigarettes are still for sale, even though we know they're dangerous. But what regulators have been able to do is force the government, or force the, com the companies to put photos of bleeding lungs on the pack. Uh, in, in other countries, you know, they have dead babies and, and all these horrible things. Uh, and I think we should be doing the same thing with these technologies, right? So when, when Facebook chooses to not protect their customers from hackers in, in Starbucks, they should tell their customers, right? They, they know, they have a pretty good idea when you're connecting via public Wi-Fi access point at that moment. If they know that, you know, just, they know what all the Starbucks IP addresses are. If they know that you're at a Starbucks, they should tell you, hey, before you log in, you should think about this. Maybe it's not safe to use this. And of course, Facebook is never, ever going to want to have to display that kind of warning. And if they're forced to display that warning, they'll just eat the cost of, of securing their system in the first place. Forcing transparency, forcing the revelation of, of, of flaws is actually a really good way to get companies to just fix the flaws, because they never want to admit that things are flawed. <laughs> Right, so you know, I really think that we should get, be getting companies to do this. I think that you know, if we cannot get the web browser vendors to fix the defaults, then I think we should at least get them to tell consumers what the defaults are and what the options are. We could have a privacy wizard that starts up the first time you use Firefox that says, do you wish to be tracked around the web? Right? Let people choose if the company doesn't want to set the right default for you. 
But you know, I really think that companies need to be putting privacy first. They're not, and they won't unless we force them to. Uh, and you know, my, my hope is that uh, an aggressive regulator will either force them to do it, or at least you know, in multiple speeches, um, take them to task for, 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 for not putting users first. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, uh, very much agree with a lot of Chris's remarks and appreciate building, uh, being able to build off of them. Um, I, I very much come to this subject matter from the perspective of an educator. Um, I'm an educator without an institution. Um, if this was the Middle Ages where you could show up at a university, lecture, and then people give you money after the lecture if you've earned it, that would be my profession. Um, <laughs> the internet is a little bit like that, although the payment mechanisms are still just emerging. Um, but I, I'm going to take a, a similar analysis of Chris, but I'm going to elevate it to a higher level of abstraction, use a slightly more sensationalist language uh, that may be a little disturbing, but I promise to both in the discussion and in the tail of my remarks try to, to ground it. But I'm very uh, much interested in the impact that the internet is having on the rule of law. Um, uh, partly because I, I do believe that the rule of law is a requirement for a democratic society even though I, I tend to be a little bit of an anarchist when it comes to my rebellion against authority. I've got nothing against legitimate authorities, the first two being my mother and my father. <laughs> so I'm always looking at when authorities are legitimate and the rule of law has allowed me to accept certain governments as legitimate because they reflect the will of the people. The problem with the phenomena we're discussing is that I think it's a cogent example of how the rule of law is being displaced if not discarded. Uh, a lot of what Chris just described is the rule of force. Might is right. That's what these companies go by. It doesn't matter how you do it. If you win the market, you win, and you can deal with the penalties after the fact. And uh, the arrogance uh, of a lot of these chief executives is they state this openly. They use the word revolution, which when I look it up in the dictionary, says the overthrow of government. And if you read their comments, they really do believe it. Right? I mean, it's a libertarian ethos that online has been criticized for almost 15 years under the term the Californian ideology. That the Californian ideology is the heart of the Silicon Valley business plan that speaks to this radical transparency that Eric Schmidt, that Mark Zuckerberg put forward. But it's something we should take seriously as regulators. And, and as an aside, it's why I've been arguing on public radio now for 15 years that the internet should be regulated by the government. The government's in the business of regulation. If it's not going to be regulating, it's not going to be the government for very long. Hence why these guys use the word revolution. And explicitly, Chris also touched upon the power imbalance between the people who have this technology and the people who use this technology. That I tend to articulate as the myth of consent, that all these contractual relations that supposedly allow this information to be collected are bogus. Not because people don't read the usage agreements, but they don't, because they couldn't understand the usage agreements. They don't understand what they're getting into. And I look at The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, as a, a resonant metaphor that people identify with because they all have the perception that there's another reality that they don't know. That this reality is one reality, great, but the other reality, they have a different view on the world. And I'm seeing this in the world of analytics and the world of real-time analytics. I'm going to be coming back to Ottawa in early January as part of Deloitte's 20, uh, 2011 predictions. And the one prediction that they publicly disclosed is that analytics is going to be one of the biggest growth industries in the tech world in 2011. And explicitly real-time analytics. So where Chris was talking, the, sur the sites you surfed a month ago, the sites you surfed two weeks ago, are quickly becoming the site you surfed two seconds ago. As their ability to understand what you're doing and, and, and intervene with, with that type of advertising. But it strikes me that, and, and I, I've been using rather colorful metaphors for this, that there's a certain imbalance in power between the individual who is surrendering their information and the person receiving it who would make Carl Jung swoon with their ability to understand the subject. Right? The amount of information that is available and uh, granted, it's not all unified yet, so it's not as if you know, there is some big brother that's able to access this. Quite the opposite. It's, it's a, a, a big bot, right? It's a machine intelligence that to some extent will be able to harness this, not understand it, of course. But it gets to this other metaphor I juxtapose, which is the dissolution between the private and the public, right? That new media allows us to share private activities in public 
while participating in public events privately. So in both cases, you get this kind of back and forth where literacy becomes your ability to determine which is which. So those of us in the room, and I suspect it's almost all of us, we have a high level of literacy. And I'm not adding a prefix like web literacy or media literacy. I mean basic literacy, reading, writing, arithmetic. We're somewhat able to get a sense when we enter into these relationships how exposed we are, how much is out there, and to determine where we're private, where our public is, and how to share that. But others, it's not clear. And what you're seeing around this metrics, around this analytics, is the emergence of social hierarchy. I'm not saying social hierarchy hasn't always existed. This is a new type of social hierarchy. Some use jargon like influence, other use jargons like social capital, inaccurately and inappropriately used. But it speaks to, again, in the education world, a phenomena called what you test is what you get. And what you test is what you get is a critical pedagogy that says the problem with test-driven education you're not actually teaching people stuff, you're just teaching them how to do the test. So education says we need process-based education so you actually teach people the subject matter. But if you step back and look at social media, it kind of is this popularity contest that is what you test is what you get. That there are very explicit rewards for participating in this system and trying to game it to, to influence it. Now, I, I use all these services, I play all these, and I suspect many of you here do. And, and Joseph, I'm going to pick on you again, as I did on the consult, because every time I go to Pearson, every time I go to, to Ottawa Airport, and I check in on my Foursquare, I see Joseph Thornley is the mayor of the Air Canada Maple Leaf Lounge. <laughs> and I think, man, that Joseph Thornley, he must be a mover and a shaker. He's always here in the business lounge. He knows all these people. Man, I want to get to know that guy. He's probably a real player. And I'm not being sarcastic. I really do have a lot of respect for him. And you know, I wait for him in the back of the room. And I'm sure he's doing a lot of great tweeting today. But there are other people who it's, they may not be as critical in assessing that social power. And in coveting that social power, are entering into relationships with, with companies, with entities that are far more powerful than they're aware of. So I'm very partial to, to Chris's suggestion that there needs to be a warning. There needs to be a, a mechanism of ensuring that that consent is there that people understand exactly what they're getting into. Because if I could, and, and I'll try to, to, to end, to, 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 to use two last points to end and so we can sort of open it up. I'll, I'll indulge me in a moment in a, a bit of a sensationalist political metaphor that uh, allows the historian in me. An, an additional one. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I'm going even deeper. This, this is all, you know, gradations. As we all know, uh, history loves to repeat itself. And certainly, ignorance plus history equals repetition. That the whole reason we study history is to learn from our mistakes. And we can all acknowledge the 20th century had a lot of horrific mistakes. And at the start of the 20th century, there was a, a revolutionary movement that was really articulated by the notion of a vanguard, or a dictatorship of the proletariat, as having an agency to lead society in this new tech utopia. Now, I would put forward to you that early adopters fit that archetype quite well. That early adopters, as they've been colloquially referred to, are a vanguard in our era. That are, are, are courted and coveted by tech companies because they will determine which technologies succeed and which don't. And there's a zealotry and a privilege that comes with that vanguard in which they believe they are part of a revolution, they are leading that revolution, and, and their zeal is indicative of that. Now, if you span that out, and here I'm being even more ridiculous and I don't actually believe what I'm about to say, but I'm going to carry the metaphor nonetheless. I, I personally I really dislike generational gener generalizations, right? I, I'm all for demographics. I, I've studied David Foote and Boom Bust Echo, and there's a lot of validity to that. But I never identified with Gen X. I always rejected Gen X, and I equally reject Gen Y. To me, it's a myth, a myth used to articulate a generation and market to them. It has very little to do with demographics and demographic power. But Gen Y is also an attitude. It's an attitude of I'm Gen Y and I'm entitled to this and your enterprise is going to change because my generation is going to change it. Now to me when I look at Gen Y, and I've had some very negative exchanges with a number of individuals who self-identify themselves as Gen Y. <laughs> to me, they come across quite a bit as Maoist cultural revolutionaries <laughs> who believe that re-education of non-believers is the only way to get people on our side. Now I started by saying I don't really believe that. And, and I'm, I'm being facetious to make a joke, but nonetheless, the zealotry is there. 
Now, when this manifests, as it did in Germany, the way people egged houses that opted out of Google Street View, it starts to tell you that it's a cultural side to this transparency. When Eric Schmidt says, you don't need privacy if you have nothing to hide. And Zuckerberg says, you don't need privacy if you have nothing to hide. And then Bill Blair, the chief of Toronto police, when arguing that the cameras put up for the G20 should remain, says, well, if you don't need privacy if you don't have anything to hide. Ignoring research, very clear empirical research that says CCTV cameras don't work, but then you go over to Britain and you look at what's called the Internet Eyes Project, in which they're taking social media, in which they're taking the gaming side of social media, and because they don't have enough humans to look at all the CCTV cameras, they're now not only going to let citizens be voluntary constabulary to watch the public squares, they'll give them rewards. Financial, social, political rewards for helping them spy on their citizens. So, for me it comes back down to the rule of law. And that if we as regulators, if we as a government don't respond to this privacy crisis, this attempt through rule by force to change our political, economic, social landscape, then besides the fact that it will be impossible, we actually undermine the authority of government. Because people look at government and say, they're not doing anything to protect us. They're not doing anything to warn us about these things that we're being exposed to. Now, Douglas Rushkoff. Uh, who's an American media theorist, has a new book out called Program or Be Programmed. And the title, I think, is an excellent metaphor that, that he uses this analogy, that with every new paradigm, his example is with the invention of the alphabet, only a small group of people actually used it. With the uh, invention of the printed word, only a small group of people actually used it. The invention of television, radio, only a few small group of so here on the internet, we all think that we're benefiting from this revolution, but the reality is we're not, because we're not programmers. None of us actually know to do what friends of Chris had done, which is figure out that all this stuff is going on. But yet, we all need that literacy. We all need that capability. OK, granted, we're not going to get it. So where does that leave us? Education. There is a genuine opportunity around education to tell people what's going on. Because I believe, and, and Chris and I debated this earlier today, and he kind of won because he had research to back it up, and I had to concede to it. <laughs> but I believe that the average person cares about their privacy, suspects that something is going on, but doesn't really know. They want to know, and if they did know, I think they would act rationally. Chris's argument was, in fact, 50% of the people don't have any clue whatsoever. And OK, I can concede that point. But the issue for me around knowledge is the ability to make that decision, and more importantly, the ability to speak to their elected representative. Because that, to me, is the problem. The political class does not see this as an issue. The reason they don't see this as an issue is because explicitly they had to discard their own privacy to get political power. <laughs> and conversely, they understand, and I don't agree with this, but they understand that privacy is a commodity. So once they obtain political power, political power will translate to wealth. And once with wealth, they can buy back their privacy. Jim Prentice has demonstrated this uh, recently in terms of his recent appointment to, I believe it, CIBC is where he got that very plush job. He'll go back to the private world and he'll be very private. Thank you very much. So how do we get the public to put pressure on legislators to upgrade the Privacy Act, to rewrite the Privacy Act? This morning, um, I was uh, commenting with friends on how disappointed I am that in the new spam legislation, CRTC gets jurisdiction for botnets which is a huge, huge mistake, because botnets are not a technical problem. They're a political problem. They're a business problem. They're a social problem. If you look at botnets as just a technology, you won't understand how effective, how infectious they are as a method. But if you understand botnets from a privacy perspective, if you understand botnets from a consumer protection perspective, a regulator would take a completely different perspective than the CRTC would. So for me, the issue is educating the public to get them to see it as a political priority so they can empower the regulators to do what we need them to do. Sadly, even that seems like a bit of mission impossible, but that's why we're here today, <laughs> is so that we can have these discussions and get a sense of how to expand this dialogue so that more Canadians have a sense of what's going on. Because if I could say one last sentence, nobody does. I mean, I you know, spend incredible hours a week researching this stuff, and I'm a professional researcher and a, a, a journalist, so I have uh, lots of help to do it all. 
I can honestly say that I cannot quantify the problem. We really don't know the extent to which any of this stuff is happening. We get glimpses, we see shadows, but you know, you start a, a research project, right? You do a literature assessment. You do a sense of what's, we don't know. I, it's, sorry, one last sentence. <laughs> Why the government has not had a royal commission on the internet blows my mind. The internet is having a substantial impact on every aspect of society, and we have royal commissions on much smaller stuff. Why are we having a royal commission on the internet? Can you respond Thanks. quickly? Yeah. <laughs> so Chris would like to respond, and then maybe there might be some thoughts in the audience. <laughs> so uh, go ahead and clap for him, please. <laughs> so I, I do want to touch on, or respond a little bit to, to your, your sort of call for education, mm -hmm. because I actually think that education is not the answer. Mm -hmm. Um, if I go and buy a car, the dealer doesn't teach me how to uh, change my oil, my oil. I don't actually have to tweak the engine for three hours before I can go and drive the product off the lot, right? The car comes safe by default. It doesn't blow up when I drive it home. Uh, if, if, uh, if you buy a new car. Not a, not, not, not no, a, not even a, then. No, because if you're a cyclist in Ottawa or in Toronto and someone buys a new car, it ain't safe by default. For the cyclist. For anyone else on the road. Okay. All right, so hang on, let's leave that alone. <laughs> but the car isn't going to blow up on the driver okay. on the way home. If, if, the, if the wheels explode, that's a class action lawsuit, at least in the States, waiting to happen. Um, but what we have with technology is the products are not safe by default. Right? So you buy a new PC from Staples, and it's filled to the brim with crapware that you have to uninstall because it's slowing you down. Uh, none of the, the default settings on, on, on the account are set in the right way. When you sign up for a Facebook account, none of the default settings are, are set to be safe. Everything is set to be exposed by default. Right? At, at least w Microsoft comes with a firewall and antivirus software now when it, it didn't used to. But you know, we expect every consumer to be their own chief information officer. We expect them to be their own chief privacy officer and their own chief security officer. At least at companies, you have someone else doing that for well, you. And, and not just that, but Facebook accepts, accepts, uh, expects them all to be master spies. Like on the one hand, we expect them to be chief information officers, but on the other hand, we're giving them the tools to spy on their friends and to spy on everyone around them. So it's, it's an interesting... Well, but at least you have an incentive to learn how to spy on your friends, but you don't have uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, the same incentive, or maybe you should, but you don't eventually learn. And, and with a hundred different settings, you're gonna get them wrong. And so, you know, while I think we can train consumers to be, to be smarter, uh, I, I, I think that approach is not going to lead to where, where it should. Uh, and so I, I really do think that we need to make it so that the products out of the box are safe. And, and we, the market has not delivered products that are safe by default. So are there any questions in the audience before we start discussing this? Yeah? I have a question for Christopher. Uh, you focus on the browsers and, and uh, the other uh, foundation tools. But to achieve privacy by design, don't we have to reach through to all of the individual developers uh, who ultimately are neglecting to build that in? Do you want me to restate the question since he's not mic'd up? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the question is, um, uh, should we focus? So I'm focusing on the browsers. Should we be, be addressing all of the developers too? Um, so I mean, I think it would be great if developers would learn to write uh, code that is, is both safe and secure by default. Um, both in, in terms of software security, but also in terms of their data, data handling practices. Uh, I think that may be a losing proposition, but luckily, most developers are not building things from the ground up anymore, right? So they're all using APIs provided by third parties. They're using software development kits. When you build an app, you know, you're, you're building on the Android platform, and so most of this stuff is already done for you. You, know, you will add some additional logic for your particular app, but the location handling code is given to you by Google. The advertising code is given to you by, by, by Google as well or by one of these other companies. Uh, and so we can, we can actually take care of most of the stuff just by focusing on a few of the players. Right? So you get the companies providing the APIs to choose safe options by default. So when, you, as an example, you know, on a mobile platform, before an app can access your location information, it has to ask you. And the reason is because the, 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 the platform uh, vendors have built those, in, those things in by default. So location in, information is actually pretty good in that space. What we don't have is the same sort of controls and, and, and consent requirements for other kinds of data, right? right? Which is why we saw all these Facebook apps uh, uh, leaking information to third parties like Rapleaf uh, that was reported in the Wall Street Journal recently. But 
the, the, the platform vendors, uh, the operating system vendors are in a really good position to, 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 to make it so that anything that works on top of their code is safe uh, by default. Well, and, and this is where you, that, those arguments are getting close to Tim Wu in, in his latest book, The Master Switch, which even though it's getting a lot of criticism online, I think he makes very powerful arguments that we're seeing the rise of new monopolies, that these monopolies should and have to be regulated for the public interest, not necessarily in a heavy-handed way, maybe exactly as you're describing that they're forced to implement privacy controls at an API level, at, a, at, a, at a, a, an infrastructure level. So all of the ecosystem that builds stuff on top of them are forced to use that privacy logic that's embedded in. The question there, yeah. I'll actually use the mic. Um, David Elder, Steichman Elliott. Um, I'm hearing education on the one hand, transparency on the other, but it sounds like really you're both talking about uh, mandated defaults. It sounds like legislated, kind of paternalistic, this is what the baseline is. Am I, am I reading that right? Yes, but I use maternalistic instead of paternalistic. Okay. Okay. And, and for me, the education would make such controls, such impositions, legitimate. If you don't, and by education, I don't mean persuasion. I really mean consultation, discussion. So you're allowed, because right now, if we're if our assumptions are correct, that 98% of the market have no idea what's going on, then not only are these illegitimate transactions and contracts that are being established, but people aren't really having their input as to how the market should be regulated. And self-regulation isn't working because consumers aren't informed. So I say education so that whatever those regulations are, they're accepted by industry, they're accepted by civil society, they're accepted by government, so that you don't have this, ooh, big brothers coming along, but rather, just like a speeding law, just like a seatbelt law, these are regulations that work for everybody. And, and so I, I believe that things should be safe by default. However, I understand the political realities, at least, at least of my country, and a little bit less about yours, but um, you know, the, the House in the US just went red to the Republicans, uh, who are very pro-business, and they are not going to be giving the FTC you know, strong new authority. Uh, and so we are not going to see, at least in the US, strong consumer protection laws mandating safe defaults. So as a backup, I think at least, edu at least educating, or not educating, but at least uh, making it clear what the flaws in a product are is, is, a, is a decent second way. I, I definitely think that it's better that the products not have the flaws in the first place. But if they're going to have the flaws, they should at least be forced to tell consumers what the flaws are. Because right now, the entire business model of behavioral advertising depends on consumers' ignorance. They're not telling you that you're being tracked. They're not telling you how you cannot be tracked. And, and, and they want to make it really, really difficult for you to stop them. Um, the other thing I, I, I do want to mention is that, um, and you can definitely sit down, um, uh, is that we live in a take, or leave, take it or leave it society. right? So I sign up for Facebook, and I can either accept their terms of service, or I can leave. Now, you know, their terms of service say that I have to give them my true name, my true facts. I cannot lie about my name, cannot lie about my gender. I cannot li I'm not, you're not even supposed to lie about your interests on the site. Um, but, and people have been kicked off for not having their real name or not using their real photo. Uh, but what this means is that because all the apps are now on Facebook, you're now required to tell the truth to the app developers too. Now, why should I have to tell someone who makes a horoscope application what my name is? They don't need that to give me the service. And, and, and they wouldn't have got it in the past. But because they're all using and building on this system that requires truth, we don't get to lie anymore. And, I, and, and while you know, lying gets a bad rap, especially from, from, from parents, um, I actually think that lying is a privacy-enhancing technology. And we, and we get by through our everyday lives through little white lies. Right? When someone asks you if they look good in that, in that shirt. <laughs> right? Um, or they show you the, you know, the photo of their dog like, and then ask you, isn't it cute? Right? Th those are lies that well, we just... And, and in fact, I've successfully argued in an Ontario court that a status update is fiction. Now, Facebook would disagree with me. But the argument is no one actually puts an honest profile photo up. No one actually says you know, what they're really feeling. It's an embellishment. That's the whole point. And I mean, but yet, the other side assumes that it isn't assumes that it's total transparency. And what you're describing, I see as not so much an ideology, but a worldview. Facebook is part of a worldview that comes out of Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley, I mean, I, I follow the Toronto startup scene quite closely. The Ottawa scene, not as much. 
But there isn't a lot of venture capital in Canada. If you want to start a company, chances are you're going to go for Silicon Valley startup capital. And Silicon Valley startup capital comes with a world view. It comes with a California ideology, as I refer it, and I throw that keyword out there so you can Google it and go find all the other people who've talked about the California ideology. But if you want to get funded, you have to embrace that world view, and it doesn't include privacy by design. It doesn't include the world view that probably the majority of Canadians believe, but yet are disempowered from having an opportunity to either express that view or see their elected representatives. And, uh, it's close. <laughs> there, there's, yeah, you know, I, I, it, it's, in the, it's in the broader genre, but so, so just, let's not go Pomo. So, so, so just finish this point, which is that we, we are forced to tell the truth, the apps that we use, right? So we're at least getting slightly better now on the mobile platforms because the apps have to tell you what they're going to do. So you install an Android app and it says, this app would like to see your contact list, it would like to use the internet, it would like to see your location. But you cannot say no. You can either say yes to all of the things it asks for, or you can say no. And what you're not allowed to do right now is to lie, right? So if, and if the app is compelling enough, you will say yes, right? If the app is giving you YouTube videos or, con or content that you want to see or horoscopes or crossword puzzles, you will say yes. Pretty low standard for compelling. Well, and, and, well, but, and because Chris is not a Facebook user and is abstained from Facebook, I suspect maybe you do know this or not, I see it all driven by peer pressure, right? Like I have often said there's a handful of people I've looked in the eye who can honestly tell me they joined Facebook voluntarily. Almost everyone I've talked to says they joined because of a friend, because of a family member, because someone else persuaded them to do it. And with the apps, it's the same way. Your friends say, oh, you got to check out this app, blah, 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 blah. It's all based on, a, 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 again, a lack of consent. When, when it's go back to your analogy, isn't that how dangerous political parties start? Right? Everybody's doing it. <laughs> and and uh, ironically, the result of this, to bring it back to reputation management, which we sort of skirted around, narcissism becomes an essential life skill. Because we don't have access to our data shadow, our profile. We grasp to get a sense of what's out there. We're about to go to a job interview, and we want to know how people are see us, so we reinforce our narcissism. We're constantly searching ourselves and looking for ourselves because we know everyone else sees us, but we want to know who we are. A whole other existential crisis. For another but that, that's a very important point because that's basically the response now within this worldview is, listen, you shouldn't be protecting your privacy as much as you should be embracing narcissism and you should be putting as much information as, as possible out there in, in order to manage your reputation so that you can filter people's perceptions based on your outlandish perception of yourself and your portrayal of your own benefits and... Uh, and foil, foibles. Yeah. Now, Krishna, you had a question, or is it we've <laughs> long stripped it? <laughs> I said, uh, have we long by stripped it? <laughs> oh, so. no, no. Well, I, I'd like to ask uh, both of the speakers what kind of powers do you think regulators should have? And maybe I'll ask realistically regulators outside the United States, because the political picture that you just reminded of us makes me too very skeptical um, uh, about any drastic change coming, but the rest of the, the world is kind of stuck with this technology and all its social uh, consequences. Um, and we know that the European Commission now has just, I forget which one of you mentioned it, that in fact we are faced with monopolies. These are huge monopolies. Why aren't they subject to antitrust laws? And I think the European uh, Union has just moved on that. But what kind of um, real deterrence could you create to check this behavior, because that's the role of regulators, to, to have persuasive and deterrent powers in order to shape public policy. So what kind of things do you think we could do in, in an ideal world, supposing we were given those possibilities? I mean, so if we're talking about the world in which we all get ponies, uh, then, yes. um, <laughs> and that would be a great world. Uh, <laughs> but what about all, all, all the poo from the well, we'll, okay, all right. All right, we'll leave that alone. So, so, you know, regulators in different countries have vastly different approaches. And I, one of the things I really like about the South Korean regulators is that they get guns. Um, <laughs> and um, now I'm a pacifist and I, I don't really want to, to be in that business. But when, um, you know, when the South Koreans are investigating Intel for, say, abusing its, its monopoly power, they raid the company's offices at 2 a.m., guns drawn, and seize all their files. 
I think that's sort of cool. Um, <laughs> So, but I, I actually don't think that it would help you very much, and you probably don't really want to be in the, in the gun carrying business. Um, the training would be horrible. So, so, you know, while these are U.S. companies, they all have offices in Canada, right? So Mozilla has an office, and I think one of their big offices in Toronto. Their executive uh, directors. Yeah, that you, and and he doesn't want to leave here, right? So you could put him under house arrest. Um, <laughs> Microsoft has a big office here. Google has a big office here. Um, does Apple have an, an office in, in Canada? Facebook does. Facebook has an office, uh, and even if they're not, um, you know, if they don't have offices here, do they have data centers here? Are they, do they have a, a nexus here? Do they, are they taking money from advertisers in this country? And if they have assets that you can seize, then I think that, that you know, you have some leverage over them. Um, I think that, that, you know, you should, I, ideally you, you would be given, you know, broad powers by the parliament um, to uh, enforce, uh, uh, you know, safe, defaults uh, uh, in these companies. Um, and, and failing that, I think that, that you should be personally going on an aggressive campaign of speaking to, to, to the media, to, to your citizens, and let them know that these companies are not their friends. Right? We already have um, the career services departments and universities emailing their students in the States saying, Facebook is not your friend. Right? Or don't talk about cables. Yeah. yeah, or don't talk, eh, that's a completely different story. Um, but, you know, we, we should make it clear to consumers that these products are not there to help them. And, you know, there's, there's uh, this, this phrase that someone else coined, but I think this is fantastic. But if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? You are not paying for Facebook. You are not their customer. The advertisers are their customers. And you know, insofar as you have not been, you personally have not been given powers um, that you should be, then use your bully pulpit and give speeches and name names. You should be naming the companies that are not protecting their customers by default. If Gmail offers encryption by default and Microsoft is not, you should be telling Canadian consumers that when they use these services at Starbucks, they are not protected by default. You should be asking Starbucks and the other internet cafes in town to post notices. Right? So when you go to a, a coffee shop in town, before you can get on the internet, you, have, you get redirected to this page where you see this terms of service and where Starbucks gets to advertise their $7 latte. Um, they should use that page to let you know that the following services that you probably want to use are actually not safe. So if I'm finding a bridge between the two of you in terms of regulation versus education, and in fact, is, is the analogy is back to, to Jesse's political movement. And I, I, I well, and dare I say counter-revolutionary. No, no. But and, 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 and that's where, where I sort of, again, play with it as a metaphor, but try not to bring it back to reality. But to, to use that counter-revolutionary and, and come back to, to, to your question, I think step one is, is the issue of authority. Um, granted, the commission has authority in Canada, but the government doesn't. Not as much. And I think part of it is a perception of irrelevance, especially amongst young people, that they don't understand what the value of that relationship to government. So they look at Facebook, they look at the government, and they think Facebook is more trustworthy. That Facebook reflects their interests and their culture. So I personally I, I don't have an answer to that, but I have my own research project on the future of authority and understanding how that's legitimized. But to step back and, and sort of get to, to Chris's level, I mean, WikiLeaks is, is teaching us a lot about the power of embarrassment and, and, and the power of, of uh, transparency when it's put on those who are not used to being transparent, even if in Facebook's case they're forcing everyone to be transparent. So I agree with everything he said and, and would tie that back into the multilateralism, that when that becomes most effective is when it's not just Canada, but when it's Canada and the EU, Canada and, and other countries. I, I think that was very powerful from the media end I mean, I'm always like, I, I, I'm not in control of what I get to talk about on CBC Radio. Every week I have to pitch to my producers and say, please, I'd like, like coming Monday, what I pitch to them that I want to talk about is this G20 investigation and how even though the police are not able to identify the police, people are using the web to identify, but they said, no, Canada's not interested in that conversation, so I'm not allowed to have it. So I'm always pitching to them privacy ideas, and it was when you had the multilateral stuff that it became news, that they allowed me to talk about it. So, so that's key on the authority sense, that even though it's an American company, when it's multilateral, that makes a difference. But to bring it back to WikiLeaks, I would be interested in seeing a type of crowdsourced project 
in which, you know, granted, we're still a long way from actually engaging Canadians in this issue, right? There's a lot of education that has to happen. But there's a lot of experts. There's a lot of people in Canada who are really interested in this subject matter. Some of this research is happening academically, like David Lyons and Andrew Clement and all those different folks. But there needs to be, and this is where I criticize Andrew and them a bit more, there needs to, it needs to happen in the media sphere rather than in the academic world. And you know, it, it's, you guys I think have done a lot of good work in your consultations to get there. But to go where Chris said and actually start to pick a fight. Actually start to like, you know, we're hearing from Canadians that they're concerned about, fa or that they're concerned about profiling and analytics online. So we're going to build a crowdsourcing project in which we try to quantify the extent to which Canadians are being surveilled. The extent to which, and you, you know, hire a, a part-time social scientist to construct the survey to, and just get people to help with the research. Because as we all know, uh, except for Chris, because he may not, uh, the, the government here in Canada has sabotaged the long form census. Uh, uh, the census is of course used as the statistical basis for most statistics. <laughs> and in getting rid of the long form census, they've essentially killed most statistics. So we have to get our own stats. We need to get our own data to be able to take the argument to politicians, to take the argument to Canadians, and to do it in a transparent way, a la WikiLeaks. And just as an aside, Take, for example, Rogers. And, I, and I, I could say this about any of the telecoms in our country. I had a conversation uh, with a Rogers analytics executive three weeks ago uh, at a gala. And he said three sentences to me that made me want to hear five more paragraphs, which was him bragging about he, how he knew everything about every Canadian who was a Rogers customer. That their profiling, that their analytics uh, would blow people away. Once he realized who I, who I was, he shut up, and no matter how much I could ply him with liquor and try to get more out of it, I was totally unsuccessful and the conversation quickly became hostile. <laughs> but I'd love to know whether it's someone in Rogers who leaks it, or whether it's all the technologists and activists in Canada who work together to figure it out, something's going on and I'd like to know what it is. And there's no way for us to know without having that type of crowdsourced WikiLeaks style expose that embarrasses these people. Because everyone, I think, all oh, the regular public would be like, for shame, that's terrible, how dare you? Even though in the case of WikiLeaks, there's no real juicy bits. I mean, anyone who follows political science and geopolitics is like, ah, oh, that's all old news. But to the average Canadian, it's scandal, and it's front of the pages. It would be easy to recreate that, given that there are lots of privacy scandals out there. And with the public's help, I think that it could, in, in less of a utopian, more in a practical way. Though I agree with Chris that being armed Makes a big difference. And if you, and, 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 but, but, but in all seriousness, I think what you're missing, which the FTC has, which is fantastic, is subpoena power. Yes. I mean, one of the, uh, I was telling your colleagues earlier that one of the most pleasurable things that I got to do at the FTC was to both write subpoenas and then read the documents that came back from, <laughs> from the companies whose products I'd use on a daily basis. Um, and the things they, they will tell you as a, as, a, as a member of the public and the things that they will say when they're forced to by law uh, are, are two completely separate things. Uh, they lie to consumers all the time. And, and so you know, if you have to go to, to, to the parliament and, and, and ask for one thing, subpoena authority is, 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 should be number one. It felt good to have the shoe on the other foot. Uh, yeah, I mean, usually I'm the one receiving the, 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 the demands. It's great. <laughs> but e even with all that said, I, I think you have both the authority and the mandate, even though you already are doing a lot of public education, public speaking, and, and not just you, but the office. I, I think you have the right to, to ratchet up the tone, to be a little more, not hostile, but confrontational. And name names. Yeah, and, and I think the respect and support you'll get from the Canadian public and many elected politicians will be substantial. Because, I mean, I, uh, Senator Pam Wallen is kind of a friend of mine, even though politically we're at opposite ends of the spectrum. The other day I was like, so how come you're not on Twitter, Senator? You know, how come you're not using Facebook and keeping a blog? I mean, it must get boring in the Senate. What else is there to do other than kill climate change bills? And she was like, no way, I value my privacy. I don't understand why anyone would use that. So, so we got into a big discussion. So there are lots of people. And because she's a journalist, she has a different sensibility than other politicians. But nonetheless, I think it's there. And it's just a matter of pushing it out inch by inch. Because, and, and I don't mean this about yourself or the commission, but Canada, I'm sure this is true in America, are terrified of industry. 
and are terrified of being criticized by industry. And what industry does here, and this goes right back to the information superhighway, is they tell you you don't understand. They tell you you don't get it. You don't have the right words. You're not using our jargon. The reality is they don't get it. They don't understand. And we're so conscious in digital economy consultations and all this stuff to use the industry's language when fundamentally we need to change the debate. They control the playing field. They control the terms of what privacy is and how we understand it. And as Chris has been saying, I think quite eloquently, they're liars, bald-faced liars. So we've got to move it to, to actual public policy, not market policy, and talk about how public policy is going to deal with this very difficult problem. Any questions? Complaints? <laughs> rants? I want to follow up on uh, yep. well, I'll ask another if I, if I can. Um, privacy by design. I want safety, not the illusion of safety. I want control over privacy, not the illusion. Um, even if we build in a privacy default, uh, when I'm presented with something, I'm like a kid with candy. Yes, I know I'm going to get a cavity, but I'll eat the candy first. <laughs> Shouldn't it also be accompanied by some kind of default rollback of permission given so that people have a chance to sample whatever it is that they're giving up their privacy to get at, but then they have a chance to reflect based upon a value versus uh, a cost versus benefit in a, in a knowledgeable way. Do you want to summarize that question first? Just, just to, to, yeah, to summarize that, uh, Joe was asking about the implementation of privacy by design and um, a very apt analogy about uh, uh, wanting to sample candy even though uh, he understood that it would give him a, ca a cavity. Um, and, the f and the opportunity when uh, wanting to sample that candy, when wanting to look at an app or an implementation, uh, the ability to look at how that might roll out and give it an opportunity to roll back to previous settings so that they had an opportunity to make an informed decision about uh, the choices they were making in terms of privacy. And that, in fact, was an argument made by actually a, a Google uh, public policy um, uh, specialist in an, an IEEE publication last summer as well, that she argued that informed consent does in fact exist, Betsy Masiello, because until you know what you're agreeing to and how it will affect the conditions within which you operate, you can't actually make an informed consent, uh, which undermines a whole lot of our regulations. But. Um, so, I mean, I think this is difficult because once the genie's out of the bottle, it's very difficult to put it back in, right? So you try out by opening up your Facebook profile and suddenly Google indexes your private information and it's out there for all the web to see. It's very tough to roll things back. I mean, the only way you can really roll things back is when you're working on a single system controlled by one organization. But because this information is flowing from one company to another, you know, we don't have that anymore. I think an, an example outside of the space you were describing um, relates to the way that court records are handled now, right? So you commit a crime when you're young and foolish, but over the age of 18, and the, the judge tells you if you're a good person for four years, the record will be expunged. Well, we have companies like LexisNexis and Westlaw in the States who go to every courthouse on a weekly basis and buy all the records. And so it doesn't matter that the judge has expunged the record four years later because anyone can go to LexisNexis and buy the record that should have been gone, right? In, in today's society, we don't have the ability to forget or to delete. And this is also a concept like privacy by design that's sort of gaining some traction, but the law isn't there. Although, and, and this comes back to the narcissism, what happens is people realize because they can't delete, the solution is volume. Create more and more volume so that you're, and this is the reputation management, so that the incidents of debauchery that, and, and certainly in my, my case, if you search me and get to the third or fourth page, you'll realize I was arrested in 1994. And if you go even further than that, you'll see some even crazier stuff that's <laughs> on me on the internet. Thankfully, no one goes past the first or second page on Google. So they just get a sense, this guy's really respectable. He knows what he's talking about. It's, it's a problem. Yeah. And for me, that arrest was a conditional discharge. So they said, oh yeah, there won't be any record of this. And yet that record still exists. And I see it all the time up and that mugshot they took and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I definitely think it would be good if you could try things out, but I think it's really, really difficult to, to deliver that in practice. Mm -hmm. Sorry, question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't question know. Is that people? No. Oh, but it's Chris. So. <laughs> <laughs> He's a plant. <laughs> I'm a plant. <laughs> um, if we take this discussion to the realm of economics, one of the things that really um, concerns me is the whole discourse 
very strong in some areas, that to tinker the least bit with this whole scaffolding is going to somehow plunge us into dire economic straits. And that the whole information economy now is basically, the, the mantra goes, the driver of the world economy. And for most of us not being economists and not knowing the relative value and are the figures good and so on. And so you have things said very seriously by very able people. Can we have privacy and innovation, knowing that in a capitalist society or society's innovation, of course, is, is a wealth creator? And so, you know, we're, we're in bad economic times. So apocalypse is, you know. I, I think it's easy to make. It's a very powerful. I think it's easy to make the opposite argument, and the U.S. economy is the obvious, that they didn't have regulation around mortgages. As a result, we all know what happened. I think not having privacy regulation is an equally dangerous issue. Yes, I agree, the knowledge economy is, is absolutely driving the economy, and it will require privacy controls the same way that e-commerce requires trust. It's a prerequisite. The fact that we don't recognize it as a prerequisite has to do with the imbalance and biases in the system. I mean, you use the word able. Really, I think of authority. There are certain authorities who make that argument, but they might not be able because they're not talking to the type of outlaws and people on the periphery who have an interesting perspective on what's going on. But no one from Bell ever asks me what's happening. No one from, see, a lot of these industry groups, they would reject everything that I have to say. And yet, like Chris, I certainly put a lot of work into the ideas that I'm coming from. And again, regulation is a good thing. We've gone through 15, 20 years of trying to argue the opposite. And in almost every case, it's been bad. That without regulation, bad things have happened economically. Companies have gone out of business, have been damaged. All the companies we talked about today are not Canadian. It is not our job to protect non-Canadian companies and non-Canadian citizens. Canadian companies are going to need privacy so that they're not vulnerable to economic espionage, so that they're able to win customers and maintain customers. Privacy by design is a concept that I think is going to ascend to become normal, whether through government regulation or through market regulation, where eventually the market just punishes people who don't provide privacy Sadly, it might be Facebook who's punishing people who value their privacy. It depends on the, but I'm a bit of an optimist in trying to think this. But privacy regulation, I believe, is central to success in innovation, central to success in the knowledge economy. Transparency equally is important, right? All these other characteristics equally important, but I think privacy is a competitive advantage. And the, the jurisdiction, the legal environment that gets it right, that figures it out first, will have a huge competitive advantage globally. It's just like carbon credits and carbon trading. Everyone gets a sense that at some point, if we want to live on this planet, we're going to have to figure out a way to manage it. So whoever figures out how to manage it first, as they've done in Scandinavia, will be able to benefit tremendously from that economic certainty, that economic stability. There are, in Scandinavia, with incredible carbon taxes, with incredible environmental regulations, a lot of innovations going on in fuel, in that whole energy sector because of that certainty. Obviously, the tar sands, the oil sands are going to be dealt with. As soon as they're dealt with, there'll be prosperity rather than uncertainty, and there won't be a sense of, oh, what do we do about it? We are afraid of the future. Rather than address these real problems and figure out a sane way to deal with it, we keep deferring, and industry profits from that deferment. And let's face it, and, and, and I'll end here with an analogy, Ken West, uh, 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 National Post newspaper chain, was bankrupt. Uh, this it, it was a classic anecdote of, to me, the corruption of business. It was bailed out by the creditors. So the creditors bought it to ensure that they got dollar for dollar of their debt, and they don't care what happens to the company now. So granted, the company's going to kick and do all these things as post-media, but fundamentally, the protections of the people who own the companies are far greater than the protections of the people who are exposed to the companies. So whether these companies go bankrupt or not is not going to affect any wealth. What we want is long-term stability, not Nortels. I keep warning people that RIM is the next Nortel. That, that to, to not anticipate that history repeats itself is what puts Canada in such a precarious position because this is not our capital. It's not our economy. 
All these companies are from elsewhere. So it's in our interest to create an economic environment that protects Canadian companies, which means privacy is going to be something we want in the future if we're going to be in a democracy. Because if we're not going to be in a democracy, that's a whole other conversation. We're not going to have that conversation. So privacy, I think, is a requirement to, to, to innovation and stable economic prosperity. So I, I think that there are two things that I hear usually. So what, one is that if we require companies to respect privacy by default, then we will make the entire online advertising business go, go belly up. Um, and of course, because all the, in, the newspapers are all totally screwed right now, they are looking to behavioral advertising to, to keep them afloat. So the newspapers and, and the, the entire sort of online media is also a big supporter of, of that and pushing against privacy reform. Um, but the other argument that we hear is, well, con you know, if we protect people's privacy by default, then consumers are going to have to pay for the services they've been getting for free right now, right? And no one wants to pay for the services that they're enjoying um, right now. And you know, I think these two points can be dealt with in, in, in independently. So on the first one, on the we will destroy the economy point, you know, not all jobs are sacred, right? So when no, I mean, this this sounds horrible, but right, but but. <laughs> You know, th there, there are good people who were employed in factories making cluster bombs. And when we sign treaties, or at least the U.S. hasn't signed it because the U.S. doesn't respect human rights, but when other countries sign those treaties, people manufacturing cluster bombs lost their jobs. You know, I, I described, I don't know if I did it here or, or before, um, earlier today, but you know, th there was this, this paper that was uh, discussed a few months ago and, and highlighted in Forbes last week talking about how you porn um, was violating people's privacy and uh, digging into your browser and, and showing your, your, your history. Someone was paid to write that code. Someone was paid to write every, uh, every piece of, of malware, every virus, someone profited from that. Those people deserve to lose their jobs. No one is fighting for the job of the guy writing the code that violates your privacy. The engineer who wrote the Facebook code that flipped the privacy defaults, his job isn't sacred. And, and if I could just quickly intervene on that point. I mean, for interest of full disclosure, I am on the board of McLaren McCann, which is the largest advertising agency in the country. That industry has its own problems. And regardless of this privacy thing, they're going to lose those jobs and have all those issues. And it has nothing to do with an attempt to implement privacy by design. Right, and so insofar as some jobs will go, others will come back, others will, will, will be created, right? So when we got the automobile, everyone whose job it was, was to previously to, to, to be a, a horse and buggy driver, they all lost their jobs. But that's okay, right? That's what happens when, when we get uh, you know, new innovation and new technology. We do not currently have a market for privacy. Think of all these smart Canadian cryptographers and security researchers who will be employed when these companies are building crypto into their products. Right? We have, uh, you have, two or three universities that are putting out top-tier cryptographers. Carlton here in, in town has a really, really good uh, program. They need jobs. Um, and, and if every company has to build encryption into its products, they will have jobs. Um, and, and you know some uh, some other engineer who's, who specializes in tracking technologies, they will lose their job, and then they can go back to school and learn how to build privacy enhancing technologies <laughs> and get a, and get that job instead. You know, if we force companies to reveal when and where their products are not very good, they will have to fix them, and then we will have a st we will stimulate a market for privacy. Right? When, when you today you can go to Staples and you can buy products to protect your security. You can buy disk encryption products. You can buy antivirus products. You can buy spyware products. There really isn't any privacy software that you can buy. And one of the reasons for that is consumers don't really understand how little privacy they have. If they knew how bad things were, maybe there would be hot Canadian startups selling really cool privacy software. And so I really see this as, as, as a growth opportunity. Now, with regard to the point of, well, if you take away this advertising revenue, then people are going to have to pay for the products they use, maybe that's OK. Maybe that's OK. Because right now, we have an exchange, my data for the service you provide, but it's not a consensual exchange. Consumers don't know they're giving up their data. Maybe they'd be willing to pay 25 cents to read that article if they had the easy means to read it versus um, giving up their data. Right? If it's a choice between paying a dollar for the crossword app or letting that app mine my contact list and sell it to um, uh, a data aggregating firm, I'd pay the dollar for the app. 
But I don't think people realize the true cost because the companies are not e explaining it. And they, knew, they know that if they had to, to tell people what they were doing, that the people would be running away from it. Not to mention that if we're talking about innovation, they'll innovate. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know. I think that you hear this mantra all the time. Yes. yes. Chris? I think this lady in the front, did you have a question? Oh, OK. Well, Chris was first, so and then. No, I was just going <clears> to. <throat> Ask in terms of the economic stimulus that privacy can can provide, which I think is actually, if you change the word privacy to security, is actually part of the government's agenda, both in, in Canada and the United States. This whole uh, idea of, of taking seriously cybersecurity. Uh, but what do you think about? I mean, because we have to, as a sort of public advocates make a pitch for this as, as realistic and achievable, I mean, how do you kick or, or change the message from one where privacy is always a cost to one where, by God, privacy can be, you know, can be a feature, can be a saleable feature, can be a securing feature, can be all of these things. I mean, we try to make that pitch, but I don't know that we, we always get taken terribly seriously when we say it. So, so, so most companies at this point have chief privacy ooh, and chief security officers. And for many years, they were ignored in companies. And then the companies have data breaches. Uh, and then the chief security officer is suddenly listened to. Right? And so you know, after every company has a security breach, the first thing they do is they deploy disk encryption software on every laptop they buy. It's the first thing. It's always the case, right? Think of all the copies of, of, of Norton and PGP that have been sold after data breaches. And before the breach, if the CSO went to the, the company and said, look, I need another $5 million for this thing, they were told no. But the cost of the breach, once they've had it, is way, way worse. And I think you know, what we're seeing is that maybe privacy will, will be this case. But the, the only way that companies will, will do this, and the only way that the chief privacy officers at companies will, will be empowered, is if the companies are taken to task for their problems, right? So in, in the States, there's, there's been this fantastic series by the Wall Street Journal, like week after week after week, just dropping these bombshells. And one of the things they showed is all these companies that were allowing third parties to monitor users on their sites, right? So Comcast was found having like 50 different companies tracking people. Dictionary.com had all these cookies. Um, and you call up the company, the, the journal called up the companies and said, why do you have these 50 cookies? And they said, well, we don't know why we have them. You know, the marketing department let someone else do, do that. But you know, once the companies are getting calls up from the journal and these companies are appearing in the newspaper and then getting sued, um, you can bet that the chief privacy officer is now an empowered individual in the organization. Now, before any new cookie can be delivered via the site, the chief privacy officer has to sign off on it. Think about what's happened at Google. They've had Google Buzz, Google Street View, they've had all these monumental screw-ups. And one of the reasons they had them is that every product that went out the door didn't have to get the sign-off from the, the privacy team. Right. They, did have, they had to get the sign-off from the security team, they had to get the sign-off from the legal team, the marketing team, all these other teams, but there wasn't a privacy team that had to sign off. And after these things, and in response to you know, conversations with regulators in this country and in the, in the States, their privacy engineer, their main one, Alma Witten, got elevated, and everything that goes out the door has to get the sign-off from her team now. You know, in a, you know, there are people working at every company who care about privacy, but oftentimes they're ignored because other features you know, are more important. I'm sure there are people at Facebook who told Zuckerberg, this is a really bad idea, but they were overruled. And, 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 and in this case, rightfully so, because the company you know, tripled in value over the last you know, year or two. Um, but when companies pay costs for their privacy violations, when the true cost uh, is, is given to them rather than being you know, offloaded onto consumers, then the, the privacy, uh, uh, the internal privacy teams become empowered to say no next time. I think we had one last question right here. Was, was it you, Lee? Okay. What, did you have one hand? Okay. okay. I just want to point out that like, there's, within the sort of greater security industry, there's a, a strong history of regulation driving economic innovation, driving profits, driving like, economic activity. The, the two big examples are like, Vans Oxley in the States and worldwide the PCI process, which as imperfect as it is, has certainly made a lot of people a lot of money. So for people to say, you know, there's only costs associated with regulation is ridiculous. There's, somebody has to actually do the work 
caused by those, and that's, that's economic activity. Mm -hmm. So just for the microphone, so what you said is that in the security industry, uh, in fact, greater regulation than the example of Sarbanes-Oxley and, and PCI standards actually has re resulted in the creation of marketplace and creation of innovation products so that actually drove economic activity and jobs and the creation of companies to support that regulatory activity, however, however poorly formed it may be perceived. I so. think co companies are required to, to get audits every year and those audits are performed by outside you know, accountants and those accountants have mortgages and jobs and they pay taxes. And you know, certainly the companies would rather not have to get an annual audit, but if companies don't get audits, then consumers get screwed because the companies lie uh, and don't get caught um, um, you know, in, 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 their, in, their, in their activities. So you know, certainly, just like accountants have, have mortgages too, I'm sure you pay rent uh, and, and you benefit by, by companies being forced to make sure they have reasonable security. And, and I think part of the frustration that, that I think Chris and I have, have touched upon and, and many of you have, have hit upon as well, is a language issue. It is, is an issue of how this debate is framed and how this debate has gone on. And, you know, there's lots of reasons from that, both from the industry dominating the, the discourse, but also to, to, to point my finger at myself and my peers, the media does a horrifically bad job at talking about these issues, partly because very few people who work in the media understand the internet in general, but also because they too, like the political class, don't have a lot of privacy. And their power is partly because of their public persona. So they have difficulty relating to why this would be an issue amongst the public. Which, you know, uh, when we were in the commissioner's, uh, on the commission's office, we were looking at the Playmobil uh, uh, setup, right? Which is, yeah. And, and I was sort of facetiously but quite seriously saying, you know, there's a way to justify this from a budget perspective. You have a potent podcast sitting here. Because if you really want to reach people, the best way is to bypass the media and create YouTube videos of little toys. I know, for example, my nephew loves to watch little Thomas trains playing on Thomas toy sets, not the officially produced Thomas video, but home videos that are made by people with toys. Lego videos on YouTube get millions and millions of hits. So you produce little instructional videos with the flu. Here's what happens when you go through the airport and you can say, no, I don't want. <laughs> to actually do that, I mean, we all laugh, but that is effective popular education, right? That is the type of stuff that's going to reach people and allow us to shift this debate away from industry and technical jargon back to real people who can understand it in real words so that they see how it applies to their life. So this pertains to my question. Okay, and yours is the last question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of our tools public opinion research and we have our annual well it's by annual we, we poll the public it's coming up but how do you ask people about their concerns of privacy when they don't fully understand issues you don't Correct. have time to explain them you Correct. don't have a detail yeah. like you said most people don't like you, you study it don't understand it so how can we ask questions that get us the answers that give us the power to go and I mean my first response is it depends where you're asking them. Because I, I don't know how many of you do market research, but it's another industry that's having trouble because people don't answer their phone. And they're all investing in internet pools, but even then it's flawed as to why people answer them and how they motivate them, which makes it difficult for us to get those metrics. But how do you ask the question, which is a parallel to how do you agree to the usage agreement without trying it? It's these cart horse problems that sadly transcend us that it's the larger government, the larger public that we need as an aid to get to that point. The example I gave with the Playmobil stuff is that is partly use grade six level, use grade five level, right? Ottawa Sun, Toronto Sun style of, of, of journalism with no disrespect, right? The, the Sun chain is effective because it uses accessible language. We need to use equivalently accessible language to be able to get people at a point of informing. Often, we assume that we're all experts, and even in our consultation language, even in the, the press language, it's still above the heads. And, and this was where Chris earlier today kind of blew my mind, where he gave me this bit of data that 50% of Gmail users have no idea that the ads on Gmail 
are not contextual, are not based, or, or that that are based on their email, right? As opposed to right, which else. which shocked me because I assume it's so self-evident. Everyone who uses Gmail realizes that that ad is direct, but no, apparently not. Apparently, fifty percent don't, which means yes, we do need Playmobil YouTube video <laughs> things to to really reach the people who aren't being reached in our current communication channels. Okay, and yep. <laughs> with that, we're well over our time. So, so thank you very much, Chris and Jesse. And what I'd like to do, I, Assistant Commissioner Bernier has been sitting in the corner um, paying very close attention, and she has some closing notes that she's just finishing right now. So, <laughs> so I'd like to ask her to come up and just to just close the session. My name is Chantal Bernier. I'm the uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner to Privacy uh, in Canada. Uh, thank you. Uh, indeed, this was immensely thought-provoking. The Commissioner opened this session by saying that the whole purpose was to identify emerging issue to be thought-provoking, and I think the objectives have been amply met. I certainly go back to the office uh, with three main thoughts that will occupy me in my analysis at least. The first one is that we need to rethink privacy safeguards, not just in the context of new technology, but in the context of a new business model that is predicated upon compromising or discarding privacy. And the second thought is that the solution resides in user empowerment, empowerment through transparency, empowerment through literacy. And finally, that government regulation must step in, and that will certainly inform our work on PIPEDA review. So this was extremely relevant. Un grand merci aussi à toi, Colin, d'avoir organisé cette séance. I think we have all very much benefited from your presence, and I want to thank you. Merci beaucoup.